let's see if that works. Is the screen, can you see the screen on that? It's like half there. Half? Okay. Well, uh, it shows too much. Can I have one of you, it's going to be hard for Michael, can you just try to see if you can... The screen is more important than me right now. Yeah. Um. Okay, great. We'll try not to shake that. Yeah. It's still on record, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to all of you for taking the effort to come on a Saturday morning. So what I propose to do today is to first uh, begin with a little discussion. I've already had this discussion with you before, uh, but I want to actually show you some of the images that would, would make the arguments uh, more coherent uh, and more palpable, more visible to you. So I want to begin with a little discussion of iconography, because I was suggesting to you the other day that there is an iconography of Gandhi, Bhagat Singh, and so on. And as I pointed out to you, the iconography of Gandhi is by far the most elaborate iconography we have of any figure. And the fact that we have an iconography suggests a certain form of deification. Because as I pointed out, it is the gods and goddesses that have an iconography. You can identify Krishna, Shiva, Lakshmi, Saraswati, all of the gods and goddesses uh, by their distinct iconography, as indeed you can icon identify Christian saints by their iconography. Uh, but I also want to, at the same time, uh, suggest certain elements of the visual culture of India. Uh, we are really looking at cinema in this class, but the concept of visual culture is more expansive. And uh, there is a consideration which is quite important that you should really be thinking about in a way, which is that if you think about the 1920s, 1930s, and you think to yourself, well, how is it that knowledge of Gandhi and knowledge of Bhagat Singh was circulated among the Indian masses? Because remember that in the 1920s, you're speaking about an extremely low literacy rate extremely low literacy rate. I mean, the literacy, literacy rate for women, for example, would have been in the single digits in the 1920s. I mean, for men, it would have been somewhat higher, but not spectacularly higher, frankly. Uh, in 1947, at the time of independence, the literacy rate in India effectively was 15 to 20 percent. That's what you're speaking about. And even now, the government claims, by the way, a literacy rate of about 70%. I don't believe it for a moment. I think it's less than 70%. Just like I think the literacy rate in the United States effectively is probably 75. And the number of people who can actually really you know, make sense of a document, I think is far less than what, what the, the state tells you it's 99% because schooling is compulsory. Uh, right? So, but we, we don't need to get into that. You understand the importance of that importance is uh, how were ideas about Gandhi and Bhagat Singh being circulated? Or about the freedom movement as a whole being circulated among the masses? I mean, these films that we're seeing, these are all films made in recent years, last several decades. Uh, some of them go back, of course, to, you know, to five or six decades ago, but it's all post-independent India. And so how were these, uh, how was the image of Gandhi put into circulation. Of course, one of the ways in which was, it was put into circulation was rumors, uh, word of mouth, the word spread. And there's this fantastic article that was written in uh, about three decades ago by a historian of India by the name of Shahid Amin. And the piece is called uh, Gandhi as Mahatma. And it's a unique study because it looks at Gandhi from below. What were the ways in which people thought about Gandhi, particularly villagers, working class people, uh, much of rural India. And in 1920, 1930, India was predominantly rural, predominantly rural. It's still 
heavily rural, but, but the proportion of the population who derived their living from the countryside, from farming, and who lived in villages would have been extraordinarily large, 90% of the population, if not more, at that, at that juncture. They were, right? So what does he show? He shows, for example, that when Gandhi went to a place called Gorakhpur, this is about circa 1920, people started talking about his upcoming visit. And then they used his name to make certain claims. So for example, let's say in a village, and this is important because when you see the Bhagat Singh films and when you see other films, you see that there are people who obviously have a dissenting view about Gandhi. And we haven't yet seen any film which is focused on Gandhi squarely. We'll get to that in the next sessions, right? But there were people who had dissenting views about Gandhi. Now what uh, uh, Shahid Amin in this article demonstrated was that when Gandhi went to this particular village, so let's say you have a particular village, he, went, he actually goes to a district with hundreds of villages, but let's say, in a, if, let's say uh, hypothetically in a certain village, you have uh, a handful of people who are not convinced that the Gand Gandhi is a Mahatma. Mahatma means great soul, the divine one, you know, the anointed chosen leader. So they refused to go along with the whole movement of non-cooperation resistance that Gandhi had put forward in 1920. They refused to go along with it. So the other villagers are now trying to pressure them, the ones who, the ones who have sided with Gandhi. So what do they do? They say things like, ah, if you don't accept Mahatmaji when he comes here, you know what's going to happen? Your eyelids are going to get stuck. You won't be able to open your eyes. You won't be able to see at all. Or literally, Literally, shit's going to fall on your head. Right? So there are these stories that begin to circulate. And on the reverse side, there are stories of Gandhi's magic power. So what he's showing you is that whatever the Congress leaders thought of Gandhi, whatever the educated elite thought of Gandhi, and whatever the colonial officials made of Gandhi, that people at the rock bottom of Indian society, peasants, workers, they had their own conception of who Gandhi was. Right? So there were, these, there were these rumors. Now, one of the ways in which people began to get some sense of who Gandhi was through these visual prints. I made some mention of them in a previous lecture. I wanted to show you just a few of these visual, these prints. So these prints are you know, approximately, so this is, this is one of the earliest such prints. And we don't know exactly how they were circulated. Were they put up on walls in public places, for example? Or were they print? And for example, how many of these were printed? You know, was it 5,000? Or was it 50,000? Or was it 500,000? We don't really know. We don't have, we don't have figures. Uh, there are a few scholars who have started working on these over the course of the last 10 or 15 years. I myself published a, very, uh, a long article just about a month ago which I can send you a PDF of if anyone's interested, looking at some of these black and white prints. Um, uh, and I was going to bring the originals today, but because it's raining, I, you know, uh, these, these are obviously originals, so I have to be rather careful uh, in ferrying them around. Um, this is one of the first ones, 1920. You see Gandhi here. This here is a globe. Right? Here's a globe there, there's, and of course, you know, Gandhi is, is uh, a, a person who is a champion of uh, spinning and weaving uh, because these were ways of keeping the economy alive. Uh, and you, in the background, you see the goddess, you see the, the flag. This is not the flag of independent India because this is 1920. India was still under colonial rule. Uh, but you see the charka there. Charka is a spinning wheel, uh, right? So that's the Congress flag. You see the goddess. Uh, and Gandhi is sitting astride this globe. I mean, we can spend a lot of time looking at the iconography here uh, of this particular print uh, and trying to understand each element of it, but this is giving you a rough idea of how, uh, so this would have been circulated. Uh, and of the fact that he's sitting atop the globe, it's as though he rules the universe. And this is, there are interpretations that people are going to make. Now, we're not going to look at, this is, a, this is from part of a slight uh, 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 presentation that I did in Bombay uh, at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences uh, in 2015. Uh, and this is based on a, a project I've been involved in for, for over uh, 10 years now. In fact, I've been working on this book for at least 10 years. 
on Gandhi and the politics of visual representation. So it includes all kinds of images of Gandhi, uh, but we're just going to look at this. So in other words, there'll be slides that we're not going to be looking at. We're just going to go through it. Uh, here's another one, uh, but this one, uh, what does this remind anyone? Anything in European art that you can think of. Yes, Carol. Virgin and, and baby Jesus. Yeah, 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 the Madonna. And, and so th this, because this, you see, Bharat Mata, yeah, so uh, Mother India, right? Uh, uh, and of course in Hindi as well. This is, however, after he was shot dead. Now, how do you make that out? Not simply because there is a date here, 1948, but let's suppose that you don't have the date. Notice the blood stains here, the blood stains, all right? So it's like, it's like the stigmata, by the way, on the body of Christ. That's, uh, and of course, you know, this uh, uh, representation in Christian art is very common. Uh, the Madonna with the baby, uh, Jesus in her lap, but you also have the Pieta, and I'll show you some instances of that, which is extraordinary, because what, what it shows, of course, is also the flexibility of these Indian artists, who frankly didn't care what, where the inspiration came from. Uh, if they thought it was appropriate, they, they would certainly deploy it. All right, and, and again, you see, it says the goddess, and over there in the, on the top, very, on the top over here, this here is, does anybody recognize that? Anyone who's versed in Indian culture, you should know immediately. Yes, Simran? Krishna. Krishna. Yeah, it's Krishna. Right? So it's as though the god Krishna is, is sort of presiding over all of this, or you know, his benevolence extends to Gandhi, so forth and so on. All right? And here you go. Look at this. I mean, this is the theater. This is Michelangelo, Leonardo, all of these kinds of artists. Uh, and uh, the, here you see the stigmata very clearly, because when Gandhi was shot dead in 1948, again, well, yes, by that time you had the radio as well. And so, so some people, my, uh, I've, I've uh, talked to my mother because she was uh, a, you know, a young woman at that time uh, when Gandhi was shot dead. And she, she says she remembers uh, that you know, people started shouting on the streets, you know, Gandhi ki hatte aogi, Gandhi ki hatte aogi, Gandhi has been shot dead. And that, that you know, people would, would uh, uh, listen around the radio, uh, you know, hover around the radio and listen to the news as it came came on, right? So, uh, and here, of course, now you see the tricolor there. You see the tricolor over there. And this is an extraordinary illustration, as I said, of the flexibility of these artists. But here you have now a print which goes back to 1920, early 1920s to 1930 period. This artist, Prabhu Dayal, many of them are anonymous, but we know that this artist, so uh, he did lots of these prints of Gandhi. And they're approximately, I mean, I would say, uh, you know, uh, one and a half feet by, you know, one feet, sometimes two feet by one and a half feet. Uh, they can vary a little bit, but this is a standard one. And, and here again, you can see that the, the trope was already in place. The flag is different over there now because this is gone before 1948, of course. But you can see again Gandhi with the chirka over there. Uh, and every, uh, some of these I'm going to have to omit. I mean, they're extraordinarily interesting. Uh, this one here again, uh, Gandhi atop the globe, that seems to be a fairly common theme. Uh, you can see the sun rising there, over there. Okay, you can see the sun rising, so there's a, a ray of light when Gandhi is over there. Uh, instead of putting the halo around him, the ray of light is suggested in a different way. On uh, the top right, you see Subhash goes there. You'll hear a little bit more about him later on. Uh, now they also had, so in this series, of prints, right? They had dozens of themes. This is how Gandhi's teaching. So one of the things that Gandhi stood for was prohibition. Um, uh, 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 and, and one of the arguments that Gandhi advanced often was that in a country such as India, particularly, you needed prohibition because among the working class people, among the peasants, uh, there was a very common problem. And that common problem was that, well, you know, the men drink, uh, and they come back home, and they've already squandered their monthly pay. That was, I mean, I'm putting it to you in a very short form. Incidentally, India is one of the few countries in the world, for all I know, it might be the only country in the world, uh, other than Muslim countries where, in principle, you have prohibition of alcohol anyhow, but that's the, argue, the point I want to make is a different one. Uh, and that is that India's, 
it's certainly the only country I know of where payday is dry day. Okay, that is that when checks are handed out, uh, it, if the state releases salaries, the state releases salaries usually on the first of the month or the seventh of the month. It varies from place to place within India. That particular day, all alcohol shops have to be shut down. All right, and it's extraordinary. And the reason why this measure was passed is because the claim was made, and there were women's movements which were demanding that. You know, uh, there were some women's movements demanding that, particularly working class women who went out on demonstrations saying that, yeah, you know, pay, payday has to be dry day because what happens otherwise is, you know, the men get their paychecks, they come back to us in the evening after they've already been at a liquor store, and half the pay, monthly pay, has already been squandered, you know, on alcohol. So now Gandhi is these are these are uh, these are palm trees or so toddy trees and this is you know you extract the liquor you ferment it right uh, and so here is Tarka uh, Sarvanash uh, the destruction of these toddy trees you know right uh, and again if we did a, a very complex interpretation then we'd have to say well to what extent was this actually really consonant with Gandhi's teachings because. There is a kind of a violence in this here, and Gandhi, of course, was an advocate of non-violence and not simply non-violence towards you know, other human beings, but that non-violence is a matter of being in the world. So your disposition should be of a certain kind if you're truly a non-violent person. But th there, would be, there would be these kinds of prints, and this is how the teachings uh, were circulated. This print is so extraordinary that I could spend a whole lecture on this one. I want to give you a little idea. And this is exactly the thing that the Hindi film was doing as well. All right, so I want to try to explain to you what is going on here. All right, so it, 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 it says that in English. So this is, by the way, the name of the, 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 name of the, the person who was the publisher, Shah Sundar Lal Agarwal. I just had a phone conversation with his grandson uh, about two months ago. The shop is still there, but he has no idea at all what his grandfather did. He was absolutely clueless, actually, uh, because I just, I just purchased uh, a whole bunch of some of these prints. Uh, very hard to find now, but uh, uh, that it's in that connection that I was put in touch with him. Uh, the, the, so it's in Kanpur, okay? So Kanpur, which is a place where Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad and all of these people were extremely active in the Gangetic Plains in, in North India. All right. Um, now, why is this print really so extraordinary? Because what it shows us is how the printmaker uses the mythic material from India and then transplants a modern day narrative onto it. Now, for those of you who are not familiar, or conversant uh, in Indian history and in Indian epic literature, uh, it is just sufficient to know that there is uh, a epic, it's called the Ramayana. Right? Uh, and uh, I have made mention of this, in fact, actually before as well. So the basic, basic story, I mean, you know, rudimentary story because the text is huge. And then there are hundreds of different versions of it. And thousands and tens of thousands of people have now produced different versions of this story over the course of the last, let's say, 1500, 1800 years. All right? So, the, but the basic story is you have a uh, Ram, uh, the, the, the king, who is also, by the way, worshipped as a god. He's an avatar. Uh, of uh, Vishnu, uh, and uh, Ram is married to uh, uh, Sita, you know, a princess, uh, and uh, his, his, one of his brothers is Lakshman. The three of them are sent into exile into the forest. All right? Uh, I, I, I don't really want to tell you why they're sent into exile, because then I'll have to give you a much longer narrative. But they're sent into exile in the forest, uh, and while they are in, in the forest, uh, exiled from their kingdom, Sita is going to be abducted by Ravan, okay? The demon king, as it were. Right? She's going to be abducted 
by Ravan, Ravan takes her away. And this is sort of like one of the two national epics of India. And during the course of this long exile, stretching out for 13 years, you know, eventually at the end of it, there's going to be a battle between the forces of Ram and the forces of Ravan. And of course, as is the case in all of these stories, uh, you can expect that Sita is going to be recovered, right? So she's going to be recovered. Uh, now, uh, 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 Ram is going to be assisted by Hanuman. So Hanuman is the monkey god, right? And he brings his whole, you know, army and of monkeys to assist. Now, look what's happening over here. Okay, so they give you the title in Hindi as well on the top, Swarajya ki Ladai, over there, you don't, you, you don't see the full, it's still cut off a little bit right there on the top. So that's the equivalent of struggle for freedom over there. Uh, and here it says Ramayan. So let me, let me use the cursor here. So here, this is Ramayan, and here it says Bharat Khan. Okay, the Ramayan has several books. Right? Or you can think of them as chapters, but they're really long books. Now, what's happening over here? Notice that it's not Ram and Ravan you've seen. You're seeing, of course, Gandhi, but it says Ramayana. So Gandhi has been turned into Ram. And then you have this figure over here. I don't know if anyone here recognizes this figure. You should be able to recognize him from the Nehru. Exactly. What is, what is the story that is being told here? During the course of this battle, Lakshman gets wounded. He gets wounded. There is a particular kind of herbal medicine which is required to treat him. It's only that particular kind of herbal medicine which will be able to cure him. It's called Sanjeevni. Sanjeevni is the life-giving medicine force. Now this is found on some mountain top. So Ram says to Hanuman, you've got to go and get this because that's the only thing that will save my brother. So Hanuman flies there, he gets to that mountain top, but of course it's like going to a huge hillside. There are thousands of these, you know, plants and herbs. He doesn't know which one it is, so what does he do? He carries the whole mountain. I mean, after all, he is a god or something akin to a god. Right? So he carries the whole mountain. That's where you see he's carrying the whole mountain, okay, over there. So Nehru has been turned into, Hanuman has here been turned into Nehru. Right? So Gandhi is Ram, and then of course you have um, Nehru, uh, who is really taking the place of Hanuman, and here he is, he's, and, and this is the mace, this is the mace that he carries, that Hanuman carries, so Nehru is carrying the mace and he's carrying the mountain and he's bringing this life-saving force. And on the other side, Ravan, by the way, has, you know, ten heads and multiple arms and all of that, and this here, and Ravan represents, of course, the force of evil. And we're, we're putting it in the rudimentary form, we're putting it in the most rudimentary form, good versus evil. So you can see what the printmaker has done now. This here becomes, the British now are the equivalent of Ravan. Because what is a printmaker trying to do? The printmaker is using the print to essentially persuade the audience, which is an audience that largely would not be able to read, for example, okay? And you do know that they, even if they're illiterate, they are conversant in the basic story of the Ramayana, the basic story of the Ramayana. The basic story of the Ramayana, the basic story of the Mahabharata, these are well known to virtually every Indian. And this is one reason why, I'll, I'll answer both of your questions a second, let me finish this train of thought. This is one reason why when you read in a textbook that the Ramayana and the Mahabharata are national epics in the way in which Home, Iliad, and Odyssey are the national epics of Greece. It's entirely incorrect. Because the Iliad and the Odyssey are not part of the living heritage of either Greece or even Europe today. If I ask 90% Americans, tell me the rudimentary story of the Iliad or the Odyssey, you think they're going to be able to tell me that? 
They don't even know the rudimentary story of George Washington. Forget about Iliad and Odyssey. <laughs> you know. I mean, 15 years ago, I read in the Washington Post, they, there's a George Washington School, of course, in DC. Uh, there's a George Washington School everywhere. But they're in DC, in Washington, DC, which is the capital. And Washington named after George Washington. George Washington High School, 21% of the seniors had no idea who George Washington was at George Washington High School in Washington, D.C. Right? So when we say that, the, that these epics occupy the same place as the epics, it's entirely incorrect because this, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, are the part of the living culture of India. And in fact, they're part of the living culture even of Muslims and Sikhs and those who are not Hindus. They know the story. They know the rudimentary outlines of the story and the moral associated with the story. This is what the printmaker is doing. He is now circulating an idea of Gandhi. He's saying, essentially, to whoever is doing this print, you know, think of Gandhi in this way. This, we are now reliving the Ramayana. There are many interpretations, but you can see, and I'm not going to enter into all of them, but this is my, what I meant when I said I could talk about this for the entire lecture. But giving you a sense of what the printmaker is doing. And I'm going to show you one more print, and then I'll take the two questions, because there may be questions. Something similar is happening here. This is an extraordinary print, again from the 1920s. Here you see Gandhi over here in the middle, okay, in the middle. And he has been turned into Krishna. So his, the, the, the spindle. The spindle used for spinning has been turned into his flute. That is part of the iconography of Krishna. He plays the flute. And there is a, there is a wonderful story about Krishna. In, and this is, again, part of the mythic material that every Indian really is conversant in. So it says here, Kaliya Mardana. Okay? And the English gives you the capture of the snake. It is the slaying of the demon Kaliya. So Kaliya is a demon in the form of a ser serpent. And it, and it lives in the Yamuna River, and it makes life very difficult for the people who are living there, because when the women and the men go into the river to bathe, so forth and so on, Kaliya is always tormenting them. So now, and, and so, so he has to, what Gandhi has to do is, he has to subdue, okay, right, Krishna. You see, see how I'm using the two. The story is that Krishna is going to subdue Kaliya, the serpent, and once he has subdued the serpent and slain it, he has liberated the people. Now what's happening here? Krishna has been turned, okay, into Gandhi, all right? And he is dancing atop the head of the serpent. He's conquered, conquered it. He's conquered it. Here you have the, the multiple heads of the snake rearing their ugly heads. These are the heads of communalism. Communalism, that is extreme Hindu, Hindu, uh, 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 Hindu communalism, that is those who believe in the idea of a Hindu identity, an extravagant, self-aggrandizing, right, exclusive notion of Hindu identity, and then those who believe in a notion of what you might call Muslim identity. If you see in the background here, it's a little bit, you know, but here you see a, uh, you see a Muslim monument, you can see the, 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 the uh, the uh, kind of like tomb-like structure, and there you see the structure of a Hindu temple, right? So this represents Hindu communalism, this represents Muslim communalism, and Krishna is uh, doing that. And on the top there, by the way, you see Jawaharlal Nehru on the right, and you see his father, Motilal Nehru, on the left. And the bars there suggest what? They're both behind bars. They're both in jail at this time. You know, they're both in jail. This is, this is during the nationalist period. And you can see that this is the kind of material that the printmaker is drawing upon. Right? These prints would be circulated, and people would begin to get an idea of who Gandhi was, what he stands for. You attribute magical divine powers to him, so forth and so on. All right. Oh, you yes. answered my question. I answered your question. Um, could you go back to your previous yeah. print? Um, I just have two questions. One, what is in Gandhi's um, left hand? No, 
woman is raised. Left hand of whom? Gandhi. Gandhi. Okay. And? And then is that uh, his ashram in Ahmedabad? Because was it there in the 1920s? Or like what is that place? Because this is Delhi. What this here? Yeah. yeah, this is Delhi, but what is that? Story? Yeah, you you sort of well, well, you you can make the inference that it's Delhi because you see the you see something that could resemble the Kutub Minar, right? right? Uh, although it, it, you know it's not a hundred percent sure, but yes, that what you're seeing over there, that the building next to the Kutub Minar or what would stand for the Kutub Minar would be either Connaught Place. Yeah. Cannot place the circular buildings there, yeah. or it could be part of the North Block Rashtrapati Bhavan complex, yeah. right? So this is def this print definitely dates to 1930, approximately or beyond. By which time the capital of New Delhi had been built. What does he have on his in, in his and left then, hand? And he, what is the location on the left? Like what? No, is, the, is it his ashram this is it? no. This is this is most likely a small church. Most likely a small church. But you can't really you can't really tell from from this you know because you have you have a a, a flag there uh, the flag is not really distinct it's not really distinct but it, it could be a kind of a uh, ashram not likely uh, you could argue that you know, maybe that goes along with with uh, you know the idea of Gandhi and his ashrams but uh, I I would say actually looks more like something like a church because there might be an attempt also to reach out to a more ecumenical kind of audience but we don't really know that but as far as what's in his left hand it's the threat it's the threat oh, okay. yeah yeah that so you see this is the this is the charta right and that's the threat there and then in the hands of all of the multiple hands some of these are oppressive bills and bills all right so for example in the Bhagat Singh fan there's this when he threw the bomb into the Central Legislative Assembly building, uh, the public safety bill uh, was being passed. But all of these bills were draconian measures to essentially contain nationalism, right? So in other words, the printmaker is showing you that the British are using both the law and force to oppress Indians. The, I mean, it's, it's quite sophisticated in that sense because you know he puts, he puts in, his, in the multiple hands various measures over here and then you can see, and there, by the way, there's a little, there's a, here, here, here you have a plane. This is a plane because the British actually used uh, the strategy of terrorizing by bombing from the air. Uh, and again, a subject for lecture all to itself, but the use of strategic bombing from the air as a weapon of terrorizing people, right? A strategy that has been deployed by the Americans, for example, in Iraq and Afghanistan, goes back to the British use of bombing in 1919 in the northwest frontier province and in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia meaning Iraq. Iraq. I mean, Iraq, they know what it's like to be bombed from the air for a long time. All right? So this is, so this, that, that's what you have over there. Uh, and, and then in, in the different, you know, there are different weapons and, so on and the, the multiple arms of this figure which represents of course British might, British power. So here you have you know the force of good, the force of evil in a clash. Right? So this is what I mean by these prints and this is part of the visual culture that precedes really the use of cinema. But if you're going to really do a proper study of, of Indian cinema uh, particularly this nationalist phase of it, you have to really try to understand it within the larger context of the visual culture of India at this time. Carol? The, in the very first image, the printing was all in English. India. The very first image. The very first image, yeah, and the names of cities. Are uh, uh, you mean this one? Before. That one. This one. Yeah. Yeah, but but all they say is India. They don't really. They, there's no there's no text that really accompanies this image. The names of cities. The name of the cities. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Right right. But but you see the thing is that uh, if you uh, if you look at this, you could say that that might give us some suggestion about you know what kind of audience that it had. But I wouldn't necessarily make that conclusion at you know, based on, let's say, a print like this, that does this mean that the, the people who, who were accessing this print were people who were more educated? No, because generally, 
generally, these plants would have circulated not only among the educated, but would have circulated among a much wider audience. Uh, this is, this is a, remember what I said, that this is the first such print. It's the earliest print. And I think that as you move along, you begin to see that the printmaker was probably thinking about what kind of constituencies he had. At this point in time, it was probably something like, we don't really know enough, uh, we don't have enough of a history of this print. So to be able to say uh, whether, for example, the printmaker simply got a uh, artist or a designer who had some material available and then quickly put it together. We don't, we don't know enough about, about all of that to be able to make uh, you know, decisive kinds of uh, judgments about it, all right? And uh, uh, I'm not gonna go over these. These are cartoons, very, very rare cartoons from German, Swiss, French magazines from the 1920s and 30s. Uh, which show Gandhi. Uh, these statues, as I said, we, uh, this is all outside the purview of what I want to do right now. Uh, I did want to show you these here uh, because you, you might, uh, uh, some of you might remember, you won't remember this image because you haven't seen this particular film. Uh, this film is on the syllabus. We will get around to it. It's called Dharam Putra. Uh, but notice the framed Gandhi that I have spoken to you about before. We've seen that in many of the films that that we've looked at already. There you see the frame Gandhi there in the background again. Uh, and this scene you should know, right? Pura Prashtan. And there again you see the frame Gandhi there on the left, right over there. Uh, and, and this is from a film that you haven't seen either, a film called Sir Karosh. And once again you see Gandhi over here, right over here, okay? Um, so, um, and by the way, Divar. Even Divar has your frame Gandhi over there, you know, it's, this is when Vijay is, you know, now thinking that, look, there's been enough of this extortion going on at the docks, I need to do something about it. And this is, of course, why you have the frame Gandhi, it's as though Gandhi is there to inspire him, to spur him on, because otherwise you have to think to yourself, why, why have that in the composition, right? It's not accidental, it's not accidental, all right? Um, and. Uh, finally, I want to just show you one or two more uh, prints, uh, a, a, a few more images. So here we go. Now, the iconography. So remember what I told you, that in the case of Gandhi, you can, so this is a complete advertisement that came out uh, in an Indian newspaper. So typically, by the way, on 2nd October, which is Gandhi's birthday, and 30th January, which is when he became a Shaheed, when he was martyred. Right? Uh, October, October 2nd is one of three mandatory national holidays in the country, so Republic Day, Independence Day, and Mahatma Gandhi's birthday. These are the three mandatory national holidays. Uh, uh, here, this is the exact ad that came out on newspaper, you know, okay? Uh, and it come, every year they, they do something like that. So this is released by the Directorate of Information and Publicity when Gandhi was shot dead. Uh, you know, he was, he was walking and he fell and his watch, okay, hit the ground and it stopped, right? So if, it, but it's not simply as though Gandhi's watch stopped, time stopped, time stopped, and yet time, and even time cannot forget, right? You could, by, you could say, by the way, this is an <coughs> exquisite intellectual advertisement by Rolex. <laughs> you know? You know? I, I, sometimes I try to do something savvy. You know, right? You know, something like that. No, but this is, you see, if you didn't notice Gandhi G, and the G is a little st stopwatch here, okay? But I'm saying to you, if you took out, incidentally, let's suppose that this was the ad, as it were. A viewer in India is very likely going to think Gandhi, all right? I'll, I'll get to you in just a moment, Krishna, right? Let me just finish this strand of thought. This is a postcard, a complete postcard. Notice no head, right? But everyone viewing this would know at once who's being represented, Gandhi. He's disembodied. He's wearing the dhoti, right, the loincloth, and he would tuck in his watch into that. This is one of those old 
watches, right? Which you, you know, you would either attach to your, sh you know, uh, shirt with a chain, or you would, and he tucks it in over here. Just one moment, okay? Yeah, uh, and and just so that you can see a photograph where you can see exactly how he wore this watch, okay? This is the iconography of Gandhi. Look at this one here. You don't see the front of the face, but when you see this, you know it's Gandhi. It's Gandhi. It's, this is what a very close friend of his called his Mickey Mouse ears, you know, right? And the bald head, you know, sh shining bald head, you could cook an egg on it, uh, and hey Ram. Those are the words that are said to have been said by him when he was shot dead. It's controversial. If the assassin and his brother say it's all hogwash. He, did. he just grunted. But everyone else says no. He said these words that God was on his lips. I've written a long article on that as well. You know, so, but here you see, uh, you know, the, the, uh, on the left, what you see is a gun. And here on the right, this is part of a series called 100 Postcards for Gandhi, brought out by a group called Samath. Extraordinary set, you know, where they commission leading artists, each of them to do a postcard, basically. You know, all right. Uh, and, and so what you're seeing is a complete postcard. And here you see a walking stick. And the way that the walking stick and the gun have been juxtaposed together suggests, of course, you know, the walking stick of Gandhi, emblematic of you know, his walk, emblematic of Gandhi himself, standing for nonviolence against the power of the gun. Uh, and this is part of that, part of that set. Uh, you see the sandals, you, the pet goat, right? The pet goat. Uh, the same woman, Sarojini Naidu, who referred to his um, uh, ears as Mickey Mouse ears, also made this famous quip. It costs a lot of money to keep Gandhi in poverty. You know, <laughs> and it's really an extraordinary quip uh, because you know he, he had a very small diet which included goat's milk. So that's the context in which I'm telling you this particular uh, episode. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, this is actually a print by a photographer who's a friend of mine, Vicky Roy. But the, the the this particular mural part of a half mile long mural on Gandhi, half a mile long in Ahmedabad, all right? And this is part of the mural, and there you see that stride, those sandals, this is Mohandas Gandhi. This is part of the iconography of Gandhi. Uh, and there you see the glasses over there, in the bottom over there, you see the, the glasses there, the sandals there, uh, a book, really, an open book, and then you see that little stopwatch once again, the walking stick. This is uh, the place where he was shot dead. Uh, uh, 30th January mark, all right, and so forth and so on. Okay, now you understand, I think, very well what I now mean when I speak both about the iconography and so what. What have we done here? And then I'll take a couple more questions. But we really talked about three or four things that are really quite crucial. One is the whole idea of the iconography of people like Gandhi and so on. I'm going to turn to Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad in just a moment, all right? So you can see their iconography, but it's much more limited. Uh, right? Then secondly, we're talking about the use of mythic material by the printmakers. They have this extraordinary reservoir that they can draw upon. Stories from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, it's endless, endless. I've just given you the tip of the iceberg in a way, but some of the best images, particularly those two that I showed you of, you know, Krishna, um, Gandhi, uh, <coughs> Gandhi as Kaliya Mardana, and, and, and Gandhi here uh, now taking the place of Ram in that new uh, Ramayana that is being forged, as it were, in the 1920s, 30s, uh, and 40s, right? And we are looking very broadly with the whole question of visual culture, and I'm suggesting to you that this visual culture is what anticipated Indian cinema, and anticipated actually the filmmakers own use of mythic material when they're looking at the lives of people like Gandhi. Okay, uh, Prashant, and then I'll go to you, and 
I'm here. Yeah. I was just wondering on the clock, it goes off at 10 10. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that 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 time is not accurate, by the way, oh. because he because uh, the time he was sh shot dead was five twelve. No, 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 yeah. I mean, that was like his like birthday was like on an October second, which would have been ten two. Well, it it it's like, it, or yeah, just, yeah, it's you, uh, it, it it's it's possible that that's why they did it that way. But now I cannot remember, by the way, whether this came out. I have to look at the original ad that I have in my collection uh, because I would have written on the ad uh, the newspaper and the date on which oh, it okay. came out yeah you know so you 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 I, I didn't I, I hadn't actually thought of that okay. you you may be right I'm, I'm not sure but you may be right you know yeah okay uh, Anya I was actually just gonna ask the same question, the same question. Yeah. okay I just said, all right um so one of my questions is you know in the earlier text the earlier iconography a lot of times the goddesses that were there were like Saraswati, which is like knowledge and the Yeah. Is like is there like a reason why like mostly Saraswati is related to Gandhi or because he was chanting as knowledge? Is that why? Uh, I don't know that people saw him as a champion of knowledge necessarily. Uh, but yes, she is the goddess of learning. She's the goddess of wisdom. Right? So I think that wisdom, truth, you know. There's a, there's a, that's part of the same, um, what you might call, set of terms which have a resemblance to each other, which uh, suggests similar things, right? That that would be that would be more more like it. Uh, you, you know, you wouldn't really see, uh, you really wouldn't see, for example, uh, Gandhi with uh, the goddess. Uh, Parvati. So Parvati is, is the consort uh, of Shiva. Um, but that's also because Gandhi is a Vaishnava. He's a Vaishnava. Right? So you would show him either with Lakshmi, who is the consort of Vishnu, or you would show him with Saraswati, because she is you know, the goddess of learning, uh, embodies truth, so forth and so on. But you would, so, so which goddess you might show him with, typically, by the way, you wouldn't really show him with a goddess, except, for example, the, where the goddess is presiding, all right? Or where he's in the lap of the goddess, but then the goddess is rendered as Bharat Mata, just as a kind of a generic mother goddess of India, you know, all right? Yeah? Um, I was thinking a similar observation about that, the, about that poster with the Gandhi G, yes. where um, it says Gandhi G, and then there are three dots, right? Yeah. And, and I thought that those might be the three monkeys or some kind of a... <laughs> Yeah, look, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure, so sure about that because we want to be a uh, little careful that we don't do interpretations that are going to be, I think, very difficult to substantiate because after all, you would have a dot over I and over J and over I, right? right? No, 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 no. That, that, would be, that would be almost impossible because you have to add the G as a sign of respect. You don't do not. I call Gandhi as Gandhi when I'm speaking to you because, frankly, I think my uh, position when I'm speaking about Gandhi <coughs> is not to put him in a position of deification <coughs> or, or reverence. Uh, as, as scholars and intellectuals and students, uh, we shouldn't be doing that. You know, If you independently arrive at your own uh, a decision that you know you want to call him Gandhiji, that's perfectly fine. Uh, much of the way in which when I speak of Muhammad, I do not say the prophet Muhammad, no. I mean, maybe a prophet to some, he's not necessarily a prophet to me, and right, so forth and so on. And similarly Buddha, I don't say Lord Buddha, but in the public discourse of Gandhi in India, you cannot address him as Gandhi, absolutely not. And that too, when the state, remember that this advertisement is being brought out by the state, and Gandhi is the father of the nation, you know. Right? So no, you couldn't just have said Gandhi. Not, not in an ad like this one. Um, but I personally do think the three dots representing the three monkeys, I think that would be a bit, bit far-fetched. You know, there are all kinds of readings that one can do, but I'm not sure about, about that one. You know. 
any last minute thoughts about that? I hope that this is this has been uh, a, a very different uh, intellectual kind of foray and exercise. Now, let me turn to the. Uh, here, let me sh shut this one and turn to. Okay, so here we go to this slide show. Okay, from current slide. Okay, so I want to just very briefly now go to the iconography. So we'll be talking about Bhagat Singh. I'm going to go back to this slide later on. I want to just uh, Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar Azad. <coughs> so for, for those of you who've seen uh, the. the you know, even Rangde Basanti, a legend of Bhagat Singh, you're not required to see, although it is available, and I'm going to spend more of my time talking about that than about uh, Rangde Basanti uh, today. But uh, this is uh, Chandra Shekhar Asad, uh, also died quite young. He was shot dead at the age of 25 uh, in a park called Alfred Park in Allahabad, um, a, a city which is, uh, again, in the Gangetic Plains in modern day uh, Uttar Pradesh. Uh, and this is a photograph from that time. So he's wearing a he's wearing his dhoti, the loincloth, uh, worn in a, in a different style than Gandhi, by the way. And you see the wristwatch here. Okay, the wristwatch over here, uh, and you can see that mustache I was adverting to, and often he's shown, right, uh, twirling his mustache, usually with the left hand, because the right hand usually holds a revolver usually holds a Colt revolver, okay? A Colt is, by the way, an American company, whole interesting history over there. Uh, but uh, this is uh, uh, supposedly, I'm not entirely sure uh, about the authenticity of this image, really, frankly, but this is uh, an image from the time when he was uh, captured. He was shot behind the tree. Uh, you see that in the legend of Bhagat Singh. So you see here his body here. Uh, lying supine because he's been killed, and you see a number of British uh, officials hovering uh, over him. Uh, this is the Colt, okay? This is the revolver uh, that he used to carry. Uh, it's now in, in, in the Ilava uh, uh, Museum. Uh, and the caption here, this, uh, here says, Shaheed uh, Azad ka vahe Colt pistol. Jisse company baag Ilava mein police ke saath sangarsh karte hue shaheed hue. So this is the Colt or the revolver, or Shaheed. So you add that as a prefix, the martyr. Martyr, that's not part of his name, Martyr Azad. This is his very <coughs> old, uh, where in, in company Bagh Elabad, that is in this, in this garden in Elabad, uh, uh, while engaged in a battle, he was, he was martyred, and that's the code that was found there, right? Okay, and, and this is from the kind of poster of Chandrasekhar Azad that circulates in the bazaar today. You know, so if you go to uh, Elama, you go to Kanpur, or you go to some freedom fighters muse museum or memorial, it's very likely that they'll have something like this being sold for you know 50 cents, the equivalent here. You can see him twirling his mustache once again. Uh, uh, the, the watch, you know that they all wear, they all wear a watch. You know, and it's really part of the iconography of uh, of Chandrasekhar Azad. But this is the iconography. It's right the mustache, the cold. But let's suppose that you had a print, as you did in the case of Gandhi. Let's suppose the print was just this. Do you think that somebody would look at that and say, Ah, Azad? No, nobody would know. That's you see, you have to. It's an ensemble. It all comes, it all, it's all together. That is the singular, and in fact, this is the only image. This is the only image, unlike in the case of Gandhi, where you can show just the head, just the spectacles, the pet coat, right, the sandals, and dozens of other things. And immediately you know it's Gandhi, but not the Chandrasekhar Azad. You can't do that, all right? Um, and this is from a photograph from that time, and once again, just here, a, a facial, a head a headshot, but you can see and and the other thing I have not mentioned here is the sacred thread. You know the sacred thread here. You would have been an upper caste, you know, person. So very often, uh, the upper caste Hindus, like him, particularly from that time, would have worn it. But what needs to be said? 
is we cannot think of Chandrasekhar Azad or Bhagat Singh or any of these people as religious figures. They, these, are, these are all characters who are self-avowedly secular, often atheist, often atheist. So he's the, uh, Chandrasekhar Azad is the head of the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. It's, it used to be the HRA, the Hindustan Republican Army, and then the name was changed to Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. I strongly urge you to see the legend of Bhagat Singh, which is, um, you know, I, which I'm going to discuss excerpts from that, and that and that is uh, uh, being made available to you. But you're not required to write on it or to see it. But I strongly urge you to see the film. Uh, cinematically, it's not very good, uh, uh, and I think both the director and the actor are frankly second rate uh, at best. Uh, but that's my own independent judgment about that. But what makes the film interesting from our point of view is that it gives you a different kind of narrative. Okay, It gives you a different kind of narrative. I'll get to it once again, Anya. Uh, and that narrative explains why the name of this organization uh, was changed from the Hindustan Republican Army. Uh, Hindustan is another word for India uh, to the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. Because if you recall what I mentioned to you in my previous lecture, these young revolutionaries were clearly inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution, by what they took to be, at that time, the principles of working class solidarity, solidarity with peasants, the, the whole idea of social justice, social equality. And they are inspired by these movements and Socialism is unquestionably very much on their mind. So there's a scene where Bhagat Singh says very clearly, much to the surprise of his colleagues, he says, no, it is not freedom. That is our mission. And they say, well, what is? And he says, it's not simply freedom. It is the achievement of an India where, irrespective of whether you are a Hindu, or a Muslim, or a Sikh, or a Christian, right, that you will have the opportunity to flourish, and that we will be treated equally. Now, we are striving for an, Indi an India where it's not simply the case that the white rulers will now be replaced by a set of brown rulers, and nothing else will change. And, and of course, that's what Rangde Basanti is about, because the implication is, so what was all that sacrifice about? Right? It, it transposes it to the present, right? to scenes of corruption, bribery, you know, the sordid state of the Indian Republic, the sordid state of Indian politics. And this is the anticipation of all of that. That's what Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar stood for in principle. This is, this is at least the standard kind of narrative. I mean, if we had to do a much more complex reading, then we'd have to really say, well, what was their relationship? For example, just to take one element, what was their relationship to, to violence? And I think that both the legend of Bhagat Singh and Rangde Basanti, in fact, do actually uh, speak to these questions to some degree, to some degree. Anya. Was it not to view these freedom fighters as religious figures, but does that include Gandhi, the religious Frederick, and iconography? Say that again? What? You said not to view them as religious figures, yeah. but are you including Gandhi in that? Because isn't he, his rhetoric and iconography, it's just rife with religious symbolism. Oh, no, but, but, I, didn't, but I didn't include Gandhi. You didn't include Gandhi. No. Okay. That's why, that's why I said when you're looking now, here I'm looking at the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. I'm looking at these young revolutionaries, Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, Chandrasekhar Azad, who is the president of the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army. Uh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, Bhagat Singh, all killed in their early 20s at the age of 23. He was only 25 years old. Right? I'm looking at this group and all the others in, in that group who were, set, who were resolutely secular. Uh, Gandhi is more complex. Because yes, there's no question that Gandhi deploys uh, various kinds of religious imagery and is a man of profound religiosity. But we have to understand that his religiosity cannot be understood in the way in which we understand the religiosity of many others. Because his religiosity also compelled him to take the view that if you are a Muslim, you should only be instructed 
on how to become a better Muslim. If you're a Christian, you should only be instructed, so to speak, on how you can become a better Christian, not on how you can convert a Hindu to Islam or to Christianity. So that if I pray, when Gandhi says, if I pray, I should pray that I as a Hindu should become a better Hindu, that the Muslim should become a better Muslim, the Christian should become a better Christian, the Sikh should become a better Sikh, so forth and so on. Now that is a different kind, both different kind of both religiosity and secularism. So that's why it's going to be, we, that would be a subject unto itself really by the whole question of what is Gandhi's religiosity, what is his conception of religion, it's going to take us far astray, but I'm giving you a bit of a bit of a hint about some of the complexities involved. You had another question? I was just going to ask in general, what was Gandhi's view on atheism and secularism? Oh, we, 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 uh, it's, it's, going to, it's going to take a long time. There is a, there is a, uh, uh, a little book uh, <coughs> written by a man called Gora. G-O-R-A, okay? That book is called An Atheist with Gandhi. So it is his impressions of Gandhi and why Gora, as an atheist, felt completely comfortable with Gandhi. I once brought his son to UCLA about 20 years ago. His son's name is Lakshman. And they, they in Vijayawada. Vijayawada is a, in Andhra Pradesh, you know, all right? Uh, but the brief answers, Gandhi had no difficulty with that at all. He had no difficulty with people who described themselves as non-believers. Uh, and uh, as I said, Gandhi would have said, if you're a non-believer, then, then maybe you should be a better non-believer. That is to say, <laughs> that is to say, think rigorously about what makes you a non-believer. You know, all right? Uh, and after all, if we all strive for the truth, who is to say that a believer has a better conception of truth, a better grasp of truth than a non-believer, right? Because ultimately, remember that the two principal elements of Gandhi's grammar of dissent are satya and ahimsa. Satya is truth. And that is the word that went into the making of the neologism that he invented, satyagraha, satyagraha, which is the force of truth. That's what he called his whole philosophy of non-violence, right? Satyagraha. And uh, the, so this is made up of the two words, satya and agraha, okay? Agraha is force and this is truth. So what you can, so usually sometimes in English it is rendered as truth force or soul force. But then the word satya itself etymologically is derived from the word sat, to be, to be, right? And so Gandhi's view was that when you offer your opponent satyagra, you are actually confronting them not simply with truth, you are confronting them with something which is inherent to the idea of being in this world. So that's, that, that the proper deployment of satyagra is bound to elicit a response from the other because satyagra is to confront someone with the very conception of how one is in the world. It's to be, you know. Right? Don't worry if that is, seems like a philosophical move that you're not quite fully comfortable with or that you don't fully understand at this juncture. But since the question was asked, I venture to just suggest that we would have to think about that here. In other words, what, what, what I'm saying here is with respect to the question, because look, I would just broaden out the question. Anya's question here was, well, where does Gandhi stand, for example, on the question of atheism? So how would I broaden it out to make it make it more germane to what we are doing? What was Gandhi's view of Bhagat Singh and Chandrasekhar's atheism? Is was he repulsed by that, for example? Was he turned off by that? Did that pose any difficulties for him? The answer would be no. I don't think that was the question for him at all. I think the question for him always was: 
does their way, does what they advocate, does it lead to a comprehension of truth? Does it lead to a, self, a certain kind of self-realization about being in this world, which also means how you are with relation to others in this world, right? I think that that's the, the, the implication of the question you're asking with respect to what we are doing. And, and I think I've given you the answer that Gandhi would have been entirely comfortable with that part of it. There were others who were perhaps not so comfortable uh, but that again is a very large question. Other thing. I still had a question regarding like some places and how they're relevant to all this movement and like our jobs and business. So like Allahabad, right? Yeah. I've seen it like couple like Pura's question, like it started yeah. in Allahabad and like I know Nehru was born in Allahabad, I mean Dom Bachan was born in Allahabad. <laughs> um, like there was like what are the relevance of like some places during like these movements and like what? Very interesting question. Uh, and now by now you're all tired of this. <laughs> Uh, subject for an entire lecture, which I can always do. You know, maybe we should just uh, one day uh, do all of those things. <laughs> so look, in any movement, there are always places that acquire a certain kind of significance. Let me give you an illustration so you understand exactly what I mean. Last September, I took my daughter, just the two of us, on a road trip through the American Deep South. And the whole point of the trip was to get her and get myself acquainted with the history of what I consider to the only real revolution the United States ever had. That is the civil rights movement. Now, when you, when you go through those places, what happens? There are some places that are of iconic significance. Selma, Montgomery, Memphis, all right? The march from Selma to Montgomery, okay? And Memphis, which is where the Hotel Lorraine is located. And that's part of the iconography of the civil rights movement because that's where Martin Luther King was shot. That's where he was assassinated, right? There, there are about eight, 10, 15 places which have that kind of resonance. Little Rock, Arkansas. If you know the history of the civil rights movement and the history of the United States, right? This is this is where one of the where the uh, battles for desegregation was fought. Now, think of it this way. Similarly, in the nationalist movement in India and the freedom struggle for independence, there are certain cities that acquire certain places that acquire iconic significance. The whole UP belt, uh, I've had, I'd have to show you a map which would show you the UP belt, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that next time, because I don't have that slide now. But I can sh show you the, the cer certain places which began to acquire a iconic significance. You have caught on to something very interesting and germane, but then we have to know what to do with it. That is, that how do these places, how do these cities, these towns, how do they function in the imaginary of the nationalist movement? Does a place become important and then that importance is further consolidated and reified? Then it seeps, right? Is, is that the case, for example, with Ilava? Ilava was, as you pointed out, quite rightly, was associated with one family in particular that was important to the nationalist struggle, and that's the Nehru family, all right? The Nehru family, Anand Bhavan, the ancestral home is located there. Uh, it is also the seat of the flowering of Hindi literature, but not the only one. Delhi was important. A number of other cities were important for the flowering of what you might describe as a modern Hindi literature. Banaras was exceedingly important, you see, okay? Right? Uh, so this is the way in which I would say it, and then I would say, that if we were to think of this map of nationalism, you know, how do we locate these cities, and what do they tell us about a great many things, such as how widespread was the movement, right? Were there places that generated intellectual activity and then also became the sites of certain kinds of political activism, or does it work the other way? We'd have to ask, pose these questions. 
But what you're registering is empirically, I think, an exceedingly important fact. So yeah. I was just like wondering, if they were like so important, then how did like a lot of these cities lose like their like right now it's Austin, right? Like they have like Delhi or like Mumbai as bigger cities. But like during like during the independence like yeah. movement, yeah. the cities that were so pivotal to, you know, the entire like scenario, like how did they sort of lose their import like I know like Allahabad, for example, like I think the capital of the United States. Yeah. Like, okay. how do you, how do you, uh, look, uh, we would have to not really get into uh, several different strands of the history of India in the 20th century and urban history because uh, your question here again is an important question. Uh, what you're asking is that look, if there are cities such as Allahabad and Kanpur, Kanpur would be another illustration, right, which clearly seem to have had a larger than life presence, if I may use that phrase, during this period, seem to be quite important. All right? Uh, and one doesn't seem to hear much of Mumbai. Of course, it wasn't called Mumbai then, so Bombay. One doesn't seem to hear much of Bombay then. Right? I'm not sure that that would be entirely correct, because remember now, now we are focused in this particular course. We're focused on a certain strand of what you might describe as nationalist activity. And it is unquestionably the case that UP, what is now called Uttar Pradesh, but back then was the United Provinces, right? That was the seat of much of the Congress activity because this is the most densely populated part of India. The other important thing is that Hindi is the predominant language in that belt. And one of the reasons why, one of many reasons why Gandhi was particularly active in that belt and when Gandhi is important, it means that there's a whole spate of nationalist organizations. The Congress, for example, has many offices, district offices, provincial offices. But one of the reasons why Gandhi was more, did more work in that belt was because he was firmly persuaded that if you're going to think about the independence of India, you're also going to have to address the language question. I mean, you're talking about a country with multiple languages. Multiple languages. And what is the language of communication between different Indians? And if you were to argue from, from the point of view of today, you would say English. But of course, the problem is, could English be the predominant language for all Indians? The answer is no. And it's no today. English is still understood by a very small percentage of people in India. So Gandhi was firmly persuaded that Hindi would have to take the place of a national language with all the repercussions and risks that it involves because obviously there are large swaths of the country where in Hindi is not spoken, where there is an animosity. There were anti-Hindi movements, by the way, in South India and in, in Tamil Nadu. So Aditya, you can begin to see that to really address all of these questions, we have to start looking at a whole spate of factors, right? Many of these printmakers were, were working from there, right? And that had some relationship. So the prints that I showed you, Kanpur, you know, vast number of prints came out of these printing workshops and publishing workshops in places like Kanpur, some in Allahabad, but there were some in Calcutta, certainly, and there were some in Bombay as well. You know, if I showed you the whole range of prints, and you would begin to see some of that as well. All right, I, I can't really uh, go on much longer with that because we won't get, get get to seeing some of the segments that I want to see. So I'll take one last question, Prashant, from you. Yeah. Sorry. So I was just, uh, just uh, wondering when this when this picture was like done. This or, this yeah. this poster. Yeah. This was done like before he before he decided to be a. Yeah, so, th so this is, so this is, see, this is based on something like this. Oh. This is contemporary to that time. So you can see, right? You can see the, yeah. the play, you can see the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, representation through which he is going to be known is now being put into place. Oh. Yeah, you see the left hand uh, twirling the mustache, you see the, the thread uh, across his chest. Uh, and by the way, I mean, a little footnote here. The other person whom you see, bare-chested, 
is who? Almost always. Gandhi. 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 So, but, you know, most people would not put Gandhi and Azad together. But, but there's an interesting, you know, sets of arguments that one could make on that. Uh, and this is a little footnote here, a little footnote, and then I'll go back, Prashant, to finishing my answer. A little footnote. Uh, clothes matter. And that is, by the way, the name of a book as well, by Emma Tarlo, P-A-R-L-O. It's a whole study of Indian nationalism and sartorial politics. Sartorial meaning what you, what you wear, the politics of clothes. You know, why, why do you see Azad in this fashion over here? And I can tell you, I could write a whole biography of Gandhi. If I had six months uh, at my disposal, I could write a whole biography of him from the time that he was a very young boy until the time that he passed away. And you would do it just by looking at how he was dressed or undressed. Because as I've often said, and these talks that I've given on Gandhi and individual politics, uh, Gandhi is the only person I can think of in world history who began his adult, began his adult life vastly overdressed and ended it vastly underdressed. All right, and then you can see all the all the stages in between. Um, but going back to the question, this was probably the image, along with some similar images, which formed the initial frame. The initial frame through which he was represented to the outer world. And if you look over here now, you can see the elements of that iconography that you saw over there. But this is, as I said, a popular print. This is a bazaar print. Yes. I think I'm so sorry, I'm really, really fast. I was just wondering why he has the kuno, I don't know what you call it, the, uh, the thread. Yeah, thread on. Yeah. If he doesn't believe in. Uh, Yes. Yeah. He's he, uh, in the case. You see, no. I didn't say that he doesn't believe in Hinduism. I said that he is resolutely secular. In the case of Bhagat Singh, Bhagat Singh is secular oh, and atheist. Oh, he's and atheist. Okay. He's atheist. He's atheist. We don't know much about the religiosity of Chandrasekhar Azad himself, but he was resolutely secular. Oh, okay, that true. none of these people in the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army staked a position as Hindus or Muslims, so to speak. Okay, that is to say that the ideology was the ideology of socialism uh, and anti-communalism, anti-communalism, right? So Azad may very well have, have in some ways said that I'm going to recognize my heritage as an upper caste Hindu, but, but it's possible and this, this is exactly what you could say of Gandhi in many ways too, that it's possible to be an, an adherent of a faith and at the same time be completely secular, be completely secular. So for example, Gandhi was firmly of the view that in independent India, the state was not going to promote one religion over any other religion. You know? but, but this didn't prevent him from being a Hindu much as it didn't prevent him from saying to Muslims, you should be better Muslims. Not that you should be thinking about some other, or Christian, that you should be better Christians, so forth and so on, you know, all right? Okay, we're going to have to really, uh, if I got that many questions in regular class, maybe we should have all our classes on Saturday. <laughs> uh, 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 I, I don't think I've seen uh, this much energy uh, in any of the other classes. Okay, so let me, let me turn to, uh, the, the film, very briefly, okay? Uh, and I want to just sh sh uh, see a couple of segments from this film, uh, which I think are exceedingly important in trying to locate some aspects of Bhagat Singh's thinking. Uh, and of course, it, it give us some clues to how the filmmaker uh, is also uh, thinking about um, uh, Bhagat Singh. So uh, let, me, let me preface it with this. I'll show you the clip. Uh, that uh, there are a number of things. I must say that I have come to a deeper appreciation myself of Bhagat Singh uh, in more recent years. 
uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, because I think it's uh, important that you understand my political and intellectual disposition, which is that uh, I have uh, long thought that Gandhi was by far the, the, the most interesting figure to come out of uh, India uh, in the 20th century, uh, in the late 19th century and 20th century. Uh, and uh, not only the most important figure to come out of India, but that he is a figure um, without any peers anywhere in the world for what he stood for. Right? And I still hold to that view. So uh, that's just my own thinking about Gandhi. Uh, and I think he is not simply uh, as he's often taken to be in the West as prophet of nonviolence or something of that kind. I think he's an extraordinarily serious and subtle thinker as well. Uh, he wrote voluminously. Uh, the man had reservoirs of energy which are just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. I mean, he founded and edited four newspapers in his lifetime. I mean, if Gandhi had done nothing else, he would have an extraordinary place in the history of Indian journalism, for example. Uh, you should read. You should read the diary kept by his secretary, for example, uh, on on the discipline to which Gandhi subjected himself. Uh, he's up at four a.m. every morning. Every morning he's up at four a.m. and there are days when he basically slept two hours. I mean, when he goes to London for the roundtable conference, and you you look at the schedule that he has, it's a punishing schedule. But it, of course, it was. Uh, and I, having one of the most indisciplined uh, bodies that I can think of, uh, I think I'm in a better position to appreciate what kind of discipline Gandhi required to have the kind of body that he did. You know, uh, never have a meal after 5 p.m. What he ate was so small, uh, you know, you could, and, 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 and of course the kinds of things that he abstained from, so forth and so on. Uh, walks 10 kilometers every day. <coughs> and while he was walking, there were two secretaries by his side, and he was dictating. And that's one of, the, one of the many ways in which he made sure that every letter he received was answered. You know, right? So for that, so on. What, what could go on? And so the, it's, 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 uh, it's an epic life in many ways. Now, Bhagat Singh died very young. He's 23 years old. Um, I have often heard it said, I teach a course about Martin Luther King as well, that, uh, you know, King died when he was 39 years old. And so I've often heard uh, it said, and I've read in many places, many people have wondered what more King could have achieved had he lived until the age that Gandhi had lived in. Basically, he died at half the age of Gandhi. Gandhi was born in 1869 was assassinated in 1948. So you can put it together, 78 years, right? And, and King was half his age, exactly half his age, pretty much. But of course, you could argue that had King lived on, you don't know what would have happened. Maybe he would have faded away. I mean, that also happens often. So we, we shouldn't take it for granted that he would have gone on from one achievement to another. You, one, one doesn't know. He could have, he could have been burnt out. He could have been compromised by politics. Any number of possibilities are there. Now Bhagat Singh is half the age of King, more or less, when he's killed. And then you have to think to yourself, well, how does one compare King, I mean uh, Bhagat Singh with Gandhi? Because many people are out to do that. And I don't think it's a very productive comparison, frankly. I don't think it's a very productive comparison. Bhagat Singh, for example, is not a world historical figure in the way in which Gandhi is. You know? Gandhi's name is iconic in ways throughout the world which it is impossible for Bhagat Singh or any other Indian to achieve that kind of recognition. I mean, if you've been reading the newspaper, I'll give you the simplest illustration that comes to mind just off the press. If you've been reading about what's happened in Armenia, there's been a whole nonviolent revolution in Armenia in the last three days, a new government has come into power, nonviolent revolution, and the man who led it, one of the things that he did was he led a march of 130 kilometers. Where did he get the idea of the march from? 
Gandhi sold much. Even the New York Times mentions that in its article. Right? So Gandhi is an iconic figure, and of course, supremely important for the people who were the architects of the civil rights movement in the United States. They all had read him. Bhagat Singh's name is confined to India. Pakistan to a degree, of course, right? To South Asia. But it's not simply that. It's just that, of course, Gandhi lived much longer and therefore, therefore could reflect on issues over a very long period of time. And we know that Bhagat Singh championed certain things such as secularism and so on. But it's not as though that there is any real profundity necessarily there. What you have is passion there. You have thought, certainly, but this is not the thoughts of someone who has been able to reflect on these issues over the course of a long time. All right? So we have, to, we have to keep these things in mind. And then, of course, his martyrdom gave him a certain kind of <coughs> iconic status. Now, the particular backdrop to the scene, and this is why, why I wanted to preface before I show you the scene, why it's important to talk about it, is that, you see, when uh, Bhagat Singh and Sukhdev and Rajguru were sentenced to death. Uh, when they were sentenced to death, the supposition was that Gandhi could have saved them. That Gandhi could have saved them. Well, how would he have saved them? So the supposition is that he would have talked to the Viceroy. The Viceroy is uh, the supreme ruler of India on behalf of the British Crown. right? Uh, that he would have talked to the viceroy and he would have pleaded for their lives. And there is a story that persists among certain circles in India that Gandhi did not do enough to save their lives. This story persists. And we're not going to try to address the merits of this story in its entirety because that again, you know, we'd have to look at the archival record, uh, but we have to understand we have to understand, for example, and this is the scene that you're going to see, that Gandhi certainly had reservations about the use of violence. Now, let's turn to Bhagat Singh and his use of violence for a moment. Because what I do find interesting is there, there is a dialectical way in which I think both Gandhi and Bhagat Singh actually think through the question of violence. When Bhagat Singh threw the bombs along with Bakuteshwar Dutt in the central assembly, Legislative Assembly building. So that scene is shown in Rag De Basanti also. All right? And you should know the scene, of course. When they threw the bombs, they threw them with the clear intention of not, not harming anyone. So they actually, you know, he looks over the, so when he's in the visitor's gallery, he and Bhagavateshwar Data are in the visitor's gallery, and then they see there's this empty spot, and that's where they threw the bomb. Because what I'm suggesting to you, there was always some conception of reverence for human life. On the other hand, Bhagat Singh did take part in an assassination attempt. And that was the assassination attempt on a person whom they held responsible for the death of Lala Lajpat Rai. So there was a demonstration. They killed the wrong person, by the way. That's, they killed the wrong person. You know. The person they were targeting was a man called Saunders. They killed Scott, right? So they killed the wrong person. Uh, and, and that, of course, makes it even more complicated, you know, all right? Uh, but, of course, even if they kill the right person, it's still an assassination. An assassination is just a lofty term for murder, frankly. I mean, when you, do a when you kill a politician, then it's an assassination. You know, if I kill the person next door, that's a murder. <laughs> I, I hope you know that. You know? You, you, if you, if you, you know, when, when a person kills a guy next door, that's, have you ever heard that called an assassination? No. You, th you think, how we deploy language. But if, if, but if I were to kill a politician, that would be an assassination. Right? But it is a murder. And murder is murder, whatever you call it. So we should not forget that. And many of the great passionate advocates and fans of Bhagat Singh are a little too quick to forget that. But I'm saying there is an ambivalence there. 
the ambivalence is that there was some conception of the sacredness of human life. There is this constant refrain in both of them, where Chandrasekhar and Azad and Bhagat Singh are both saying, you know, like for example, when, when they kill Scott and there are a number of Indian troops there that come running and then they say, go away, go away. We don't want to kill any Indians. We don't want to have, we don't want to kill any Indian. You know? But again, you have to ask about the ethics of that. So it's okay to kill white men, but it's not okay to kill Indians. That's a strange kind of humanity, frankly. You know, there is that supposition, right? Because of course, if you're human, you're human. You could make that argument. So we could we could have several different kinds of ethical layers with which we could address this question. But here is another analogy for you to help think about it. A person who is widely revered, widely revered in the West. And again, there's a troubled history there, which I have looked at very closely. I've published a long article on that as well. I'm talking about Nelson Mandela. Widely revered figure. Now Nelson Mandela is precisely the same man who actually torpedoed the policy of the ANC. The ANC is the African National Congress, which in the 1950s, under the leadership of a man called Luthuli, who was really, by the way, truly an advocate of nonviolent resistance. I mean, he was the most remarkable person of his generation in South Africa. And one of the whole, one of the consequences of this mandalization of South Africa, as I call it, you know, where it's become impossible to criticize Mandela, um, particularly after the end of apartheid and when he became the first president of a free South Africa, one of the consequences was to completely eviscerate the name of Albert Luthuli. The under Luthuli, the ANC's policy was a policy of nonviolence resistance. And Mandela was one of the people who helped to torpedo that when he suggested that it was time to turn to armed resistance. And that's and he is one of the founders of what is called the Umkonto Wesiswe, which is the armed wing of the ANC. So they had an armed wing. So these are these were guerrillas who who undertook armed um, uh, violence against the South African state. But here here is the ambivalence that Mandela was very careful in many respects about who they targeted and what they targeted. So most of that violence was actually sabotage. Sabotage. Because because much as is the case with Bhagat Singh in a way you do see some kind of notion of reverence for human life. I think that that is one of the intrinsic qualities of someone like Mandela, and that, I think, is the admirable part. So it's not like I'm, I'm wholly critical of Mandela. No, I'm, I'm trying to suggest that we have to view him in a relatively nuanced way, because if you look at the record, and in fact, when he was put on trial, the so-called treason trial, and then he was put away in Robben Island for almost 30 years, before he was then released uh, to pave the way for a new South Africa. In his trial, he, he makes it very clear that look, that when the Onkonto Ve Sizwe conducted a campaign of violence, we didn't do we didn't do it indiscriminately. So we sabotaged government buildings, we sabotaged railway tracks, we sabotaged military arm uh, depots, ammunition depots, so on, so forth and so on. And this is, I think, how you have to think about Bhagat Singh, that when you're looking at the whole question of violence and non-violence. Now, this particular clip that I want to show you then from the legend of Bhagat Singh is a clip which has to do with um, Bhagat Singh's admirers faulting Gandhi for not having done anything to save Bhagat Singh, OK? And Raj Guru and Sukhdev. We can't hear anything, so one, let me see if I can first get the volume. Uh, wait one minute. You can't hear anything, right? One second. Huh? Yeah, no, I, I think I know what the problem is. Just give me one minute. But somehow I'm not able to do it without 
getting to the volume here. Yeah. Okay. Since all of you don't speak Hindi, I'll have to go back to that. Okay. Okay, two points. Okay, the first is where Gandhi says that it's not simply, you know, you're accusing me that I didn't do enough to save them. He says they themselves don't want to live. I think he was fundamentally right. I, I think Gandhi is fundamentally right about that. I mean, that when in fact Bhagat Singh and Bhakti Deshwar Dutt go and and throw these bombs at the Central Legislative Assembly. By the way, the sentence of capital punishment was not handed out for that. <clears throat> you know, it was not handed out for that because no one was killed in the Central Legi Le Le Legislative Assembly bombing. You know, they, 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 that, was, that was an act of obviously violence against the state, you know, uh, s sabotage, all of that. But the sentence of death was handed out for the assassination of Scott, because after that, then they had, there's an informant who comes forward, and you see that in both in this film, and you know, you, you, I, I, I think it's there in Rangde Basanti, just shades of that, but that is why they were given the sentence of death, where Bhagat Singh is implicated as one of the people who's responsible for the murder of this Englishman, you know, right? And when they engaged in those activities, Bhagat Singh, and his friends understood the implications of doing that. In fact, there was a, there was a whole discussion where when Bhagat Singh proposes to Chandrasekhar Azad, remember that Azad is a president, so it's Azad is going to call the final shot on whether this action is approved or not. So when Bhagat Singh actually proposes that that's the attack on the Legislative Assembly building, um, Az Azad says that, well, we'll have to find a way to get you out. And he says, no, 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 part of the plan is we offer ourselves for arrest. Because what is he doing? He's doing exactly what Gandhi did. He understood, if I may use this phrase, that publicity is the oxygen of nationalism. Because when, he, when they throw the bombs, they know that they're going to be captured. There's going to be a trial. This is a matter of public record. This is exactly what Bhagat Singh wanted. And he understood the consequences would, would be the death sentence, you know. So, so but, but there is an interesting question, and this is really a matter of speculation. I mean, you can read Bhagat Singh's writings. There's his, there's his diary, his prison diary, for example, to see to what extent he was captivated by the whole idea of martyrdom to begin with. That maybe Bhagat Singh didn't want a certain kind of martyrdom, you know. And, and the idea is not really that novel. I mean, after all, in our own times, every day, uh, we know, I mean, if you look at, if you look at uh, the, the whole ideology of ISIS, for example, we know that the whole idea of martyrdom is, in fact, actually very much built into it. I'm not saying that ISIS and Bhagat Singh are comparable, but I'm simply saying that, I'm simply saying that the idea of martyrdom is part of a public discourse, and that's what I'm suggesting to you, all right? Um, and then he says, and Gandhi says that, look, you know, I admire Bhagat Singh's patriotism, but I have reservations about his adherence to the code of violence. And it is precisely because I have reservations about the question of violence, for that reason, I do not support the capital punishment. Gandhi was not a supporter of capital punishment at all. 
I mean, he's singularly opposed to that. In fact, he sees that as a, a gross form of violence. And he, and he offers a number of arguments, which I will not rehearse at this juncture, against the infliction of capital punishment. Right? So there is, there, is a, there, is, there is a remarkable consistency in how Gandhi is thinking through this set of problems. But there was this expectation. You see, and this is, this is where you get into all kinds of ironies, but the same people who say that Gandhi could have saved them. There, there's this, always this notion that Gandhi had these miraculous powers, that if Gandhi would simply intervene, he could have saved them. But it's the same people who say that Gandhi was a spent force. That Gandhi is now no longer singularly as important as he used to be. That the very fact that the name of Bhagat Singh was now resonating so loudly in India, that he had now become the most important iconic figure, at least for that short period of time, there was very much the suggestion that, frankly, Gandhi is now really an outdated figure, almost, a spent force of that. And yet, the expectation that all that Gandhi has to do is really speak to the viceroy and put his foot down and say that you must pardon these young men, or certainly commute their, their death sentence. You know. And so you know, we can obviously speak about those kinds of um, ironies as well. Let's just continue with this for another 10, 15 seconds, and then I'm going to show you a couple more scenes. That's Bhagat's father. There is, a, there is something which I'm, not, I'm going to just mention as a little footnote, but I, I have long thought that uh, Indians were spectacularly good, and here it's a shortcoming, spectacularly good at sloganeering. You know, you, you see this in modern day Indian politics too. You know, it, it's, uh, of course sometimes, and I'm not saying this was true back then, but nowadays uh, to get 50,000 people to chant uh, slogans is very, very easy in India. All you have to make sure is that you have a stack of notes with you and you just pay 100 rupees and you can get 50,000 people in India in no time at all. I, I can guarantee that. Even I, with all my poor skills, could probably do that. You know, just getting 50,000 people there, as I said, to chant this or that. Uh, so, it, you know, this, it, the, the, these spams, of course, I don't think they're self-aware of this problem, but this you see that in Rangde Basanti, you see this in this film, you see it in all of these films, this kind of sloganeering. Yeah? I mean, of course, you find that uh, in political rallies uh, in modern day democracies as well. You go to Washington Mall when they had the women's rally, when you have this, you know, when you have, but uh, in, in India, it has a long history, and I have often thought that uh, it was a problem with respect to the fact that there is a kind of an amphitetical relationship to this sloganeering and what you might call the principle of thought, you know, right? Um, all right, now let me turn to uh, another episode from this film. We're gonna look at three or four episodes, and this is an episode which takes us to um, uh, brief elements of the biography and history of Bhagat Singh. Oops. So that was the Gandhian led boycott. Gandhi G. That's young Bhagat, right? He's a great fan of Gandhi. Zindabad, long live. He belongs to Gandhi now. He's been dedicated to the nation and to Gandhi. Oh, all the icons, 
Namaste. You know, Vande Matram, right? Hail the motherland. The premonition that she has that he's now lost to the family, so to speak. He's embraced the larger family of the nation. We have to look at this. So Asa Yog is non-cooperation. So 1922, there is an episode that takes place called Chauri Chaura. There's a, Chauri Chaura is a small town, very small town in UP, where a police uh, uh, station, uh, you know, so you had a large crowd. Um, the British called it a mob, by the way. Uh, I wish I could go into the whole history of the idea of the mob here, uh, but I want to give you one little, so little aside, little footnote for you to think about it. What is a mob? Right? You've heard the word. None of these words are innocuous words in the English language. You know? And so you, if you read the great theorist of the mob, when I say great, I don't mean as approbation. I mean the one who I, I have strong disagreements with his rendering of it. Uh, Gustave Le Bon, the, he writes a book called The Crowd. And then he has a description of the mob. The mob was always viewed as feminine. Always. It could be comprised entirely of men, but it was always viewed in European, late 19th century European thinking as feminine. Why? Gustave Le Bon, yes, Prashant. Was it because of like France? Like, because of France. Yeah, because when they did the no. revolution. No. No. It's the, the, it, it's viewed as feminine, giving you the shorthand of it, because as Gustave Labon tells you, a mob is a large crowd of people without a head. That is, there's no rationality. There's no rationality. And this was, of course, uh, this was part of the whole 19th century sociology, which was deeply and to use modern terms, deeply racist and deeply sexist. A mob is a group of people without a head. You know, they're passionate, they're re re restless, they're mad, they can't reason. And just as women can't reason. So Gustave Labon tells you very clearly, it, it's a feminine entity, you know. Right? And uh, when we begin to look at this literature, we find all of these interesting questions because what happened Chauri Chaura? A mob, a mob of Indians are marching, <coughs> right, and raising slogans, long live Gandhi, long live Gandhi. And this very mob is now then going to burn a police station but the policemen are all Indians. They are working for the colonial state. As you've seen in all of these films, the, of course, the vast bulk of the machinery of law and order was actually Indians. The officials at the top would be British, but the vast majority of policemen who were helping to keep the empire intact were all Indians. And so this, this police station is going to be burnt. There are these you know, this, this mob had been marching, the police started taunting them, so the mob starts running after them, they, they run into the police station, the policemen lock it up. And then this crowd or mob of 20,000 comes there and they burn it. And as these policemen come out, because the building is, is being burned to the ground, they are hacked to pieces, hacked to pieces. So over 20 policemen were killed 
Gandhi said this shows that we are not yet ready for nonviolent resistance. We haven't quite understood what we have to do. So he suspends the movement. This is the news that he's brought. He suspends the movement in 19, early 1922. Look at the irony too, by the way. This is what this is what Shahid Amin in that piece that I started out today's lecture with, Gandhi as Mahatma. That these same people who are shouting, long live Gandhi, long live Gandhi, they are using Gandhi's name to now commit violence. In fact, to murder and to commit arson. And what Shahid Amin says is that the word Mahatma was like a floating signifier. This is my phrase. It's a floating signifier. It's an empty vessel into which you can put anything you want. Because how do you chant the name of Mahatma and claim to be a follower of his and then commit violence in his name? Right? Okay? Naraz is too. Naraz is so mild. That, you know, if my, my wife says something to me, I'm going to like it, my Naraz ho I got a little upset. You know, right? I mean, this is not a matter of just being a little upset. Okay? You, you know, I mean, I, I, this is a matter of where Gandhi is saying that, well, actually, the norm, what this shows, because if we are going to achieve freedom, we are going to do it through non violent means. That's what Gandhi is saying. And now you have 22 policemen who begin, and the people were saying, by the way, hey, after all, the police represent the state, so what's the problem there? They're the enemy. And Gandhi is saying, go and look in the eyes of their widows, of these policemen, and then you tell me if you think that they were just the state. They are human beings, right? And of course, this is what Gandhi is thinking about, that look, what is going to be the future of an India where we have not learned yet how to dedicate ourselves to non-violent social transformation. And that's, of course, I think a problem for every country because the state, I think, has an intrinsic attachment to the idea of violence. It is, in fact, addicted to the idea of violence. And that's not just true in India. I'm talking about, for example, this country as well. Yeah. So Bhagat, now Bhagat gets extremely upset because he has already dedicated himself to Gandhi. Gandhi appears to have now uh, compromised himself. Okay, and I want to show you uh, the scene which is. Uh, so this is now, this is Sukhdev and all of that. Um, yeah, so there's a whole scene there, by the way, with, with Jalyanwala Bagh uh, and all of that, which, which we're not going to look at, but I did want to just, you can watch this for a minute while I find the right, the one or two more scenes that I wanted to show you. Um, okay. There we go. Party ka maksa jante ho. What is the ambition of the party of our Hindustan Socialist Republican Army? And so one of his colleagues says, Azadi, freedom. And he says, Nay. No, freedom is not our ambition. Of course, everyone is surprised. Well, what are you really saying? Okay. Not only freedom.
He, he has said nothing here that Gandhi would not have agreed with him. Right? Nothing. Not a word. And this is, this is why I think that I, I myself have come to a different kind of understanding that the more I look at Bhagat Singh, I see not two polar opposites, which is what the film begins with, that whole scene at the railway station, station you know, and the way that the film represents uh, Gandhi in a number of different scenes. What is interesting to me is the convergence of the two. And I think that there's an in instructive lesson in there, even for those who are not invested in Indian history. But let's say that you have some understanding of, of American history. I mean, I think that the comparable example I can think of, with some difficulties, albeit, but you would have to think about it, is the opposition that is now almost taken for granted when you look at, when you look at America in the 1960s between Martin Luther King and Malcolm. The supposition is that they, they stood for two entirely different standpoints. And what is interesting to me is if you look at their lives, you find that slowly they are now beginning to converge. They're beginning to see something in each other that they did not see previously. I think this was exactly what was happening in India, although I think this was not part of the common sense of those times. So I'm just going to take five more minutes, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, we haven't done anything like what, we, what I, uh, as much as I thought we would cover, but that's fine, because we have uh, been able to have a productive discussion. <laughs> Okay, one last scene, because we get, it gets us to a one very large subject, and we're just going to begin to see the beginning of that scene. Um, let me let me set it up. Okay, um, this is the deployment of hunger striking. All right, you, you don't see that, by the way, in Rangde Basanti, and that's an interesting problem. So let me just want to address two subjects here. One is that Rangde Basanti, uh, of course, has two narratives. One is the narrative of uh, Bhagat Singh, his comrades, and all of that. And this white woman who has come from America, she wants to make a documentary, uh, and then she finds this group of young men, and they seem to be ideal, you know. And then gradually they're coaxed into it, and they fall into those roles, and they inhabit those roles then. Right? So there, there's that narrative, and then of course there's the contemporary narrative. The contemporary narrative, and there are all these scenes where these young men uh, are talking with each other, there's a, a kind of a cynicism about them, uh, and uh, you, you know, wondering, well, all right, so now we're playing these roles, but what is there to live for? What kind of India is, are we living in today? You know, it's an India that is uh, now defined by corruption, by bribery, by exploitation, so forth and so on. Right? And, and then, of course, uh, there is this awareness that is going to slowly come to them. And then they have a friend who is a pilot whose MiG has been shot down. Or, well, not shot down, sorry, has, has had a failure and it crashes and he dies. And, and uh, that's because they were using faulty parts. So this is you know, an instance of the kind of corruption that now plagues you know, the, the, the country, right? Uh, uh, where deals are struck, defense deals are struck, for example, uh, that benefit, uh, obviously, the deal makers and the contractors, but in fact compromise the lives of young men who are martyrs to the nation, so forth and so on. So you, you know the story. You know the story, right? So those are the two 
the two narratives um, that we have there. Uh, I will send you two little short links, very, very short. They'll take you about a minute each. Uh, Ram Prakash um, uh, Mehra and I had a discussion about this film uh, in uh, 2007 at the Taj Hotel in uh, Hyderabad, uh, a movie club had invited him and me. Uh, so we had, a little, we had a long discussion about this film. And so it was reported in two newspapers and I'll send you two little uh, clips where you can get a little bit sense of what. Uh, so uh, in this particular uh, film, uh, what is striking is, among other things, the absence of the entire history of hunger striking. Now this is important because one of the two pieces that was assigned to you, the scholarly pieces, one by Niti Nair and the other one by Kama McLean, Kama's, Kama, Kama's piece is on the portrait of a journey, how that fedora and all of that. And the other one has to do with um, uh, Bhagat Singh uh, and as a satyagrahi, as someone who can be viewed as an advocate of Gandhi and Satyagra in some ways. Uh, and she says that really what catapulted Bhagat Singh onto the national stage, and I think there is an argument there, is, is really the hunger strike. The hunger strike, because when he was confined to jail, so this is after, after the conviction for the Central Legislative Assembly bombing, uh, and then remember that it's after that, that while he's in jail, then, then, then the informant is gonna come forward, the informer is gonna come forward, and is going to implicate him in the murder, along with a couple of others of Scott, and then that is the 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 uh, the crime for which he's going to be handed down eventually the death sentence. Uh, when when the court actually delivered the sentence, none of the none of the accused were there because they had been they had been making a ruckus, they had been rowdy. That was part of their strategy. So the judge actually ordered the court emptied out, and this itself is an interesting problem in the history of law. Can you actually hand out a sentence of that kind when the accused are not even present in court? You know, all right? Uh, now, there are lots of things that emerge from it, lots of them, which I can't really get into, but uh, it, the main one I want to look at is hunger striking, but before I do that, I want to make another point, and that is, you see, this whole strategy that Bhagat Singh had was predicated on the idea that if we offer ourselves up for arrest, right, we get taken to court. And then, as I have said to you before, this publicity is what we need because there is this concern that frankly, not many people know about the Hindustan Socialist Republican Army, the ideals that it stands for, all of that. In fact, actually after the Kakori bombing, uh, the train robbery, that you know, now you're going to find that there's a period during which Bhagat Singh flees to, to Calcutta. Uh, and when he goes to Calcutta, he finds that he's an unknown entity. He's, that no, no one really knows what this organization is doing, that it's basically it's based in the area around Allahabad, you know, Kanpur, places like that, right? But that if you go much further east to Calcutta, it's really unknown. So publicity was important. But the point, the other point I wanted to make is this, the courtroom. The courtroom should be viewed as a place where Indians were particularly keen to be present because what Indian nationalists did, and this again is there's an overlap between Gandhi and Bhagat Singh and many others, is they mastered the space of the courtroom. That is that you see, the whole English supposition was Look at it this way, there's so many assumptions here. One supposition that the English worked on, and you can see now the connections with Lagan, is that we are a people who essentially trade in fairness. We believe in the idea of fairness. So if you catch a political revolutionary, you don't do what the Nazis would have done, which is take the cold, shoot the bugger dead. No, what do you do? You bring him to trial. And then you hand out a death sentence. But you, you have a trial. You give a fair chance to the person to defend himself. 
What the British had not counted upon was the particular manner in which Indians mastered not the physical space of the courtroom as such. They mastered the rhetorical space of the courtroom, their command over law, their command over the finer points of the law, their knowledge of what it means to prosecute or defend in a certain way. Right? This is what is really extraordinary. In other words, it's like the whole metaphor of cricket where the West Indians say, we want to show the white man we are better at your game than you are. Now the Indian nationalists were going to show these are the hazards for you. The English, if you put us on trial, because we have now commanded the space of the courtroom. And this is what reason why Bhagat Singh was keen on being arrested, because he wanted to be able to command that space of the court form, right? And there are all these other trajectories that I pointed to, such as the whole idea of publicity and so on. But now, to go to the last scene, and then with this we will disperse for today, right there Basanti doesn't show you the hunger strike, the long hunger strike which then began to be reported and which became a fundamental problem. And of course you have to remember who's the great architect of the political hunger strike in world history, the most well-known architect of the idea of the hunger strike, Mohandas Gandhi. Gandhi, you know, George Orwell used to, in his obituary of Gandhi, said one of the most astonishing things he said was, which he couldn't fathom, he couldn't understand. He said this small little man, frail little man, would decide he's not going to eat and the whole country would come to a standstill. The whole country would come to a standstill. You know, you, if you look at Gandhi's fast, he called them fasting. We don't, we, I don't want to get into that history. What is the exact distinction, if any, between a fast and a hunger strike? Why we do not speak of Gandhian hunger strikes, we speak of Gandhian fasts, but when we speak of Bhagat Singh, we speak of the hunger strike. There was, of course, the other great tradition, which Indians were familiar with, and that was the Irish tradition. The Irish tradition, you know? So when uh, Terence McSweeney, the Lord Mayor of Cork, went on a hunger strike in 1919 and died on the 89th day, 89 days he went without food, okay? Terence McSweeney, he became a legendary figure in India, legendary figure. So there's a very long history, by the way, of Irish political traditions of hunger striking and Indian political traditions of hunger striking, you know? But what is being argued by Neeti Nair in, his, in her pieces is that this hunger strike is what really catapulted Bhagat Singh and his colleagues onto the national stage. This is what really brought them to the attention of every Indian and made them into legendary figures. So we're going to just watch this last short episode. So they think they've crushed Bhagat Singh now because he's been convicted. And now you can have a sleep of the just. We'll just watch about three minutes of this and then we'll, we won't even, I won't even comment on it because I've talked about it a bit and, and we'll terminate over here. Thank you. 
force feeding, which is, by the way, now prohibited by international law. You cannot force feed hunger strikers. That's what they're trying to do, force feeding. And in, some of you may not know, but the first time, I'm going to stop here, but the first time force feeding was really used was uh, against English suffragettes. English women who were demanding the right to vote. Who were demanding the right to vote. And this, by the way, is the 100th anniversary of the suffragette movement in England. But they deployed the force feeding against these women. And that's when this became a matter of public record. How do we deal with these kinds of situations? When a, when a person goes on a hunger strike, critical hunger striker, uh, because force feeding is, is not simply a violence against the person. It can actually cause your death. If, when, you, when you're forcibly fed, it, you go down the wrong pipe, as it were. Uh, so there can be all kinds of consequences. And anyhow, so there's a, there's a long, long history, long history there. If anyone is interested in any of these matters, you all you have to do is email me, and I can, I can send you uh, pieces. I've written a lot on the politics of fasting, for example. Um, and a number of other subjects we've discussed today. All right, so I think we'll, uh, I think uh, you're all restless now. Uh, it's almost one o'clock, so I think we'll disperse for the day. Thank you. Did the recording get disrupted because of calls coming in or something?